All right, hey everyone, we're in the Mananico Creek. We're gonna be doing some macro invertebrate sampling. Zach is starting to do some scooping. Um, we'll get started in just a second once we see some people have gotten on. And if you're just joining us, this is Zach Nickerson and Lucia Ruggiero with the American Literal Society. Zach is over there looking through his D-net. I'll be working the camera today. And we're doing some biological assessments in the Mananico Creek in Millville. And that's a tributary to the Morris River. So maybe Zach, do you want to start by telling us what, what, what you're doing? Sure. Um, so what we're going to be doing today is called a biological assessment. So that means, in this case, we're going to be looking for what organisms are living in the stream here. So the reason we do that here is because um, certain types of these organisms are more sensitive to pollution than others. So depending on what is or is not here, that can tell us uh, the relative cleanliness and health of the stream. So what we're looking for are called benthic macroinvertebrates. Uh, benthic means bottom of the stream. Macro means you don't need a microscope to see them. And invertebrates, of course, means without a spine. So in practice, most of these guys are aquatic insects who live in the stream here. Uh, so I, had, I got my little scoop there a second ago. So I'm just kind of looking at all the little debris that I found, seeing if I can see anything moving around. And there's something, hold on. Where did he go? There he is. Yep. hold on. Okay, hold on. This guy. Let me try and do it this way. Oop. Can you see him moving a little? Mm. Uh, right here. Oop. This is called a scud. Focusing. Actually, let me. It'll be easier to see. Let's get him into my palm and put some water. Get a little water in there so we can see him swimming. There we go. Don't swim up into my between my fingers. Hold on. <laughs> there he is. Where'd he go? There he is. Okay. See him moving now? Yeah, now we can see him. So this is called a scud. Uh, he kind of looks like a tiny little shrimp. Uh, and he swims on his side there, which you can kind of tell he's doing. Um, most of the macroinvertebrates we find are actually in their juvenile state, and then they eventually metamorphosize into something that flies. Uh, the scud is one of the few exceptions. This is just how he always looks. Uh, he's just going to be an aquatic organism his whole life. Uh, so I was mentioning earlier that the reason we're looking for these guys are that some of them are, are more sensitive to pollution than others. So he's considered kind of medium sensitive. So he's good to find. He's not like one of the best ones to find because uh, he's not super sensitive because that would mean that the water must be very clean. But it at least means the water is not super polluted. So he's you know, somewhat sensitive. So as we are scooping, um, we'll be carrying around a collection bucket and then at the end we will see everything that we found so we'll sort through them and typically with the biological assessment you'll sort to 100. Um, that way you can get a good percentage of what types of organisms you find. Uh, we might not do 100 on film but we'll at least do it afterwards. Um, what else we got Zach? This guy, he's much more obvious. This is called a case building caddisfly. So there are two main types of caddisflies you'll find in the freshwater streams of South Jersey. Hold on, I'm gonna get some water. <laughs> yeah, don't drown him. Flailing a little. Let's put something in the water. There we go. He's in there. Okay. So he's a net spinning caddisfly. So um you can tell he's a net spinning caddisfly because he's got that little like broom looking tail at the end uh, of him there, at the end of his abdomen. Uh, he's got six legs and the other type of caddisfly is called a case building caddisfly. So they build like a little um, cocoon around themselves kind of out of sticks and leaves or rocks or whatever they can find. So you can tell this is not a case building caddisfly because he does not have that. He's just all naked. 
So, uh, he is also medium sensitive to pollution, so good one to find. Uh, not one of the best ones to find, uh, but it's still a good sign. So, so far, but with the scud and the case of the cows fly, we're pretty certain at least uh, we wouldn't find more to be really certain, but it's a good sign that we're at least not very clean. So, our stream must be at least somewhat clean. All right. Let's uh, maybe walk away from the road a little bit. Yes. Awesome. So while we're strolling, I'll just point out this is our YSI. Um, so the cool thing about biological assessments is all you need is your net, a bucket, and a little bit of knowledge just to know what you're identifying. Um, so it's very inexpensive to get kind of a good guess of the water quality in your stream. Uh, the YSI is something that you can use to kind of confirm that information. So that'll test for dissolved oxygen and pH and all sorts of other water quality parameters. By the way, if you're wondering where we are, uh, we're in the Mananico Creek, which is a tributary of the Mars River, and that's Route 49. So you're probably hearing that yes. we're now going to be moving farther away. So moving away from the road, so hopefully it's a little bit more quiet. So we were actually here yesterday just to scope out the area. And the stream looked completely different. It was much more turbid, uh, which means it's harder to see through, and the water was way higher. So I assume that's because it rained a lot the day before. Uh, so luckily for us, it should be easier to find macros today than it would have been yesterday. So let's. Uh, so here we have like a fallen log, a um, bunch of stuff we attached to it. So this is kind of the sort of thing that maybe some macros would like to hold on. So they're generally not just like free floating in the water because then they would get eaten by a fish or something, right? They like to hold on to things and hide, camouflage, all that stuff. So I'm just kind of um, digging a couple scoops here, kind of moving all the sticks and things around to kind of shake them loose, making sure to keep my net uh, so that the water's flowing into it. So all right. I'm going to get a little closer to you and I'm going to ask you to try and talk a little louder just so it's easier for people to hear. Okay. So, and I will be right up on you. All right, let's see if we found anything in this sample here. So, uh, just real quick, if it's better to hear now, let us know. Are people commenting? Yeah. Let's see. We're mainly looking for uh, movement. So that's that's the easiest way to kind of at least get a sense in the beginning of whether there's anything alive in here. Got a case builder. Oop. Oop, where'd he go? Sorry. <laughs> so case builders, they often just look like little sticks. Thanks for letting us know, Regina. Um, where'd you go? Um, so they're kind of hard to pop, see, but maybe we can find them. Also, just a note about this duckweed that we're looking we through. Oh, we'll let Zach see what he found first. Um, yeah, so this duckweed is actually non-native, and it does kind of take over in streams and riverbeds. So uh, there are other areas where you can go and see where it's just all duckweed. So this is a stonefly larva, or a nymph. Um, so as the name implies, they tend to live under stones, although not exclusively. Uh, you can tell what he is because he has these two posterior tail filaments. Uh, so that means he's got two butt hairs at the end here, basically what that means. Uh, he also, if I had it, actually I do have magnifying glass, but he's kind of crawling around a lot. So let's maybe not drop my net. Take out the magnifying glass here. Yeah, so Zach's going to pull out his magnifying glass so it's a little easier to see. And I'm going to work on keeping this in focus. <laughs> we'll do our best. Can you see him a little better? Not really. Mm. There we go. The now we got a little. All right. So if you can see those two posterior filaments, or as we like to call them, butt hairs, <laughs> um, that's a good way to identify the stonefly. Uh, he's also his gills are actually underneath of his arms or his legs rather. Uh, so they're kind of like where his his armpits would be. Uh, so the way you tell the difference between the stonefly looks similar to the mayfly. So the mayfly generally has three posterior filaments um, and its gills are along the sides of its abdomen. So they have usually a different number of posterior filaments and different location of gills. Uh, so if we find a mayfly it'll be more obvious the gills and I'll point them out than a stonefly, it's hard to see. 
Is it? Oh, <laughs> this guy was on my hand the whole time. Where is he? <laughs> I didn't even feel him. So that's another net spinning caddis fly there. So ooh, let me see if we can do this. Let's see. He's got the little broom tail. Um, kind of just looks like a worm, but he does have six legs in the front there. Very cool. All right, we'll add him to, add our, him to our And then let's go to another spot and see what we can find. Um, yeah, so going back to that duckweed, it's actually non-native and it's pretty aggressive. So sometimes you can see where it kind of just takes over a whole area. Um, it's not the best thing. So what we'll need to make sure that we do after we leave this stream is clean all of our waders and make sure we don't transport that to another site. And that's just called decontamination. And you can see more of this duckweed has kind of spread over here as well. So another place we'll look for macros is in what are called leaf packs. So that's just a pack of leaves that are on uh, underwater here. So uh, most of them have, by this point, um, watched down the stream. At different times of the year, there'll be more of those. Uh, but we just had a large rain event recently, so a lot of them got washed away. But I see one here, maybe. So I'll just place my ski net here and try and stay on the loose with my hand. Let's see if we found any. So they definitely like to attach to leaves a lot. So I'm just kind of looking through all the leaves, um, turning them over, seeing if there's any little guys attached. It's a lot of duckweed. We don't tend to find a lot of macros in duckweed either, so probably another indication of it not being native to the area that they don't really recognize it as food. Can you just talk a little louder, Zach? Still? Yes. Jeez. Okay. Just yell the whole time. <laughs> so just repeat what you're saying. Uh, we don't usually find a lot of macros in duckweed, which is probably, you know, like Lucia was saying that it's not native, so they don't recognize it as food. Um, but hopefully there would be some in these leaves, but I'm not seeing any at the moment. Is this a case building kind of fly? It might be. Let's see if he's a case building cat's fly. So, oh, where'd he go? There he is. So this might be a case building cat is fly. It's, um, right, this stick here, which is just a stick, or just like a tiny bit of leaf that he fashioned into a case for himself. So if I add some water to my hand here, maybe he'll pop out. Oh, I think he did. And just to repeat what Zach said, if anyone was having trouble hearing it, so this case building caddisfly almost looks like a little stick. Um, so you have to keep a really keen eye out for them. And then once you add a little water, you can see his little head popping out. Were you able to see it on the video? A little bit. He did it a little. Here, let me add more water. Oop. You can see him popping his head out there a little there bit. You can see his six legs. He's crawling around. So the case is mainly for um, camouflage and protection. So he just looks like a tiny little stick when he's inside of it. So no fish are going to find him and eat him because they'll just think he's a stick. Uh, so case building caddisflies are actually very sensitive to pollution. So this is a fantastic guy to find. That means that our stream is probably pretty clean. Again, we need to find a lot more to be totally sure in terms of our biological assessment. That this is an excellent sign that the Monantico Creek is probably pretty clean water because he's very sensitive to pollution. We'll add him to our bucket here. Alright, let's continue. Alright, so as we're walking along, we found some scuds, which are medium tolerant to pollution. That means the water doesn't need to be perfectly clean, but they can still survive. We found some net spilling, net spinning caddisflies, sorry, uh, which are also medium tolerant. And we just found our first case builder, and those are very sensitive to pollution. So they need very clean water to survive. So it's pretty cool that we found that. So they might like to attach to this log here. So I'm just kind of scraping along the side of the log and seeing if anything comes off. So just, you want to say that again louder? Yeah, I'm just scraping along the side of the log. 
Uh, a lot of guys might like to attach to the log, seeing if anything comes off. And the important thing to remember when you're doing your assessments is trying different micro ecosystems. So before he was over in the leaf packs, now he's scraping against the logs. Uh, at some point we'll probably scrape up in the stones as well. Um, Cause they're all different micro ecosystems where we may find different types of macro invertebrates. What we got? I did find one. It's another net spinning caddisfly. You can see his little, um, his little tail there is six legs and he kind of looks wormy other than that. Net spinning caddisfly. Anything else along the log? Let's see. I don't see anything obvious. We'll add some more um, scoops there and see if we can find anything else. What do you guys think? Under or around? <laughs> Under or around the log? We'll take your votes. It's your adventure. Choose your adventure. <laughs> Choose your adventure. We could probably go under. Yeah, we can go. It's not that deep. Yesterday we couldn't go under because the water was a lot higher. <laughs> Regina says under. I like Regina. She's fun. <sighs> Whoop, under the log. Zach, can I pass you the bucket real quick? Work. Thank you. Teamwork makes the dream work. Nice view of under here. Hillary also says under. <laughs> No, this is good. It's like you guys get to come out here with us. Um, normally what we would do is uh, we would work with groups of students and do this with them. And we wish you were here with us too. Uh, really cool. Do you want to talk about the jewelry weed real quick, Zach? Oh, yeah. Um, not macro related, but this is called jewel weed. This flower, this uh, plant right here. Uh, so, it has an interesting property, which is that it is good for if you have sunburn. So if you just take a little bit off, um, inside the stem here, open it up, kind of like aloe vera. So supposedly it's got some like oils that are good for removing, um, oh, I'm sorry, I said sunburn, I meant poison ivy. It's actually poison ivy. Yeah. You could have corrected me right there. Well, I was gonna, well, I thought maybe it was both. <laughs> I just know it as okay. poison that's, ivy. That's maybe fair. it works for sunburn right. too. <laughs> so if, if I knew that I had touched some, some poison ivy, I could rub some jewel weed on my skin and supposedly it breaks down the oil uh, that causes the rash, so. Yeah, so if you ever hit some poison ivy and you see this plant, the nice thing about jewel weed is it likes to hang out along rivers and a lot of times Poison ivy likes to do the same thing. We've seen it, we saw it up at the up at the beginning there. Yeah, so there's poison ivy right on the trail to get down here, but we know coming to the river there's lots of jewel weed. Um, a couple ways you can identify the jewel weed. I think the stem is the most easy way to do it. So it's stem is, uh, has little flat ridges all the way around the edges of it, and it almost has the same texture of a succulent. So that's a good way to identify it. Yeah, it's like a, it's like a light, light, um, little bit um, a little bit toothed but kind of like a like um, a rounded tooth rather than a jagged tooth so yeah that's jewel weed yeah one more duck weed you can see a big upturned tree over there yeah we got a really cool upturned tree up here um, and lots more jewel weed oh, yeah. so this place is covered in. if you hit your poison ivy come out here and uh, you'll be you'll be cured. <laughs> so we're looking for another obvious um, place to scoop for macros. So it's a little um, oh, louder. A little bare place here. So we'll go a little farther and see uh, if we can find any better places. Oh God, sorry, I just put my hand. In, sorry, I just put my hand in front of the camera.
Uh, we have a damselfly over here. Oh. Um, so I don't believe we found a damselfly just yet, but this is what it'll turn into. They're really beautiful. If you can see it, they have, whoop, it's flying away on me. Um, so they usually have teal or green bodies. Ooh, and Regina just shared an awesome fact that hummingbirds also feed on jewelweed flowers, which makes it even cooler. Thank you for sharing that. That's awesome. They do have those, like, this kind of shape that the hummingbird uh, beak would be able to get into, now that, yeah. now that you mention it. Awesome. They're orange, right? The flowers are Zach is saying he believes those are orange flowers, which have that nice conic hummingbird shape that they like. I see another damselfly up ahead here. See if we can get to it before they fly away. Ooh. So one possible place is over there where that um, tree branch dips into the water. So there might be some macros holding onto the leaves there. So we'll go see if we can find it. Um, I'm also going to uh, scrape, <laughs> scrape is the word, scrape along this log here, now that we're here. Alright, so if anyone didn't hear that, he's scraping along the log um, to see if anything is latching onto the bottom of that. This one's kind of hit or miss, um, I'll often not find anything, but when I do find things it's usually like a damselfly or something cool. Let's see, anything, any movement? Pick some of it up. All right, so you viewers, let us know if you see any movement in this leaf pack. Hold on, there's at least one there. Surprise, surprise. But who knows what this is? All right, so we've seen this one a few times now. Let me focus it so you can actually see it. Get off my finger. There we go. <laughs> um, so we're not using an iNaturalist app, um, but that's a great way to do it. I love that app. It's actually one of my favorite things to do when I find a plant that I don't know about. Um, but at the end of this, we'll actually take all of our leaf packs and what we found and we'll sort to 100. Um, and then we just keep our own records. And um, we also partner with the Stroud Water Research Center who will collect samples and um, they'll actually do a deeper taxidermy or deeper analysis than we will and they'll give us the results each year as well. Um, so we actually do quarterly sampling. Um, so that means every three months we come out and we do an assessment and we share all of our results with something called the Kirkwood Cohansey Aquifer Cluster and that is a group of nonprofits um, that work to monitor water quality in South Jersey. Um, and also in addition to the macros we'll do um, chemical parameters. So we'll actually take water samples and send them out to a lab. And for there, they'll test for nitrogen and phosphorus and suspended solids, salinity, um, all kinds of things, which give us a bigger kind of deeper picture. But the macros, I think, are the most fun part of it. Yeah. Um, and it's a nice way that we can get people involved. So that was a great question. Thank you, Louise. So here we actually have the two types of caddisflies. On the right is the net spinning caddisfly, and on the left in his little case there is the case building caddisfly. Here, come out again. He was out a second ago. I think he's freaked out by his friend. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's its uh, protection at work right there. there so it can just hide in its little case if ever it's scared. So we got our two caddisflies. So the net spinning caddisfly is medium sensitive to pollution. The case building caddisfly is very sensitive. So he's, the case builder is definitely a really good one to find. Um, and yeah, we do keep track of our results year to year. year, to year. Um, so right now we have about three years worth of data. Oh, and when I say sort to 100, we'll actually collect um, 100 samples and we'll make a note of what they each are. Um, and then from there, we'll have an idea, if, you know, if 20% of them were medium sensitive and 13% of them were high sensitive, uh, that gives us a better picture. I don't know. All right. So we'll give a second for people to get back on. Sorry about that. The uh, connection here isn't very good. We are in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> 
All right, no one's back in just yet. I think this was about where we lost service last time. This is as far as we went last time. Is it? Did we pass the Bramble? Did we? Oh, maybe you're right. I thought we only went to the house, but you know what? I think we might have been. All right, I see we have somebody back in here. So we'll just give people a second to get back in. So sorry, we are in nature, so sometimes cell phone service is hard to come by, but we got it back, so sorry about that, y'all. Woohoo, we got Regina back. Hi, Regina, sorry about that. Um, we lost service for a second, so thank you guys so much for your patience. Uh, Seems like that we just walked through a little bit of a dead zone. We are, you know, still in nature, so. <laughs> All right, what do we got, Zach? So this is another, oop, hold on, let me get him situated here. So this is another one that we found earlier. Uh, this is a stone fly. So you can see he has the two posterior filaments. Um, they're also kind of like this, this like slight yellowish color usually. It's a little unusual compared to the other macros. It's kind of how you can tell without looking very hard. Um, yeah, that's a stone fly nymph. Pretty cool. Awesome. So we got a stone fly nymph. And if anyone is new joining us, we are in the Manitico Creek right now. Uh, that's a tributary to the Morris River in Millville. And we are collecting benthic macroinvertebrates, or macros as we call them. And feel free to post any questions in the chat. Oh, there's two. All right, what do we got? Another stone fly. And stoneflies are notoriously fast. <laughs> I've been known to lose them. And I saw another one in there too. Hold on. Where'd he go? There eh, he is. We got something else too. Another stonefly. Another stonefly. They're cool though. There we go. Another <laughs> stonefly there. So um, in South Jersey, our streams are all called muddy bottom streams. So actually, you don't always find stoneflies, because as per the name, they prefer stony bottom streams, which you'll find more often up in North Jersey. Uh, but this particular um, stretch of the Mananico Creek seems to have a lot of stones on the bottom. So I think there's more stoneflies than there normally would be in South Jersey. Um, stoneflies are actually also very sensitive to pollution. So he's a great one to find. So we've found, what, like four of them so far? So awesome, our stream must be pretty clean if we're finding so many stone flies. All right, let's, let's continue. Onward. Um. So one thing that we're doing you might notice is when you're doing a sampling you always want to travel upstream. Uh, if you're traveling downstream you can disturb what you might find and then you might not get the same results. So you always want to travel upstream when you're doing a sampling. Hold on, I have one from our last one that was still there. Another uh, net spinning caddisfly there. So that's our like what, fifth or sixth net spinning caddisfly we found. Today is the day of the caddisfly. If you learn nothing else, you'll learn what a caddisfly is today. All right. Um, so with this, uh, with this uh, branches down in the water here, uh, what I kind of like to do is I'll position my net um, so it's kind of scooping up these leaves, and I just kind of shake them with my hand is easier, in my opinion. Uh, see if anything comes loose. So again, he's just checking the leaves that are kind of dangling in the water to see if anything has latched on and is eating those leaves. Or usually that's what they do. Uh, so we'll see what we find. And uh, looking through all the leaves here. Try and get a little better light. Oh, 
There's a bunch of stone flies. You see them? Or at least two. I'm trying to focus. All right, so we got a couple stone flies in here. One. See it? Hold on, let me. I'm trying to focus for Hold you on. all. Also, he's crawling down me. <laughs> oh, there's a scud. Um, for those of you that weren't here in the very beginning, this is the first one we found. Uh, the scud just looks like a little um, shrimp that swims on its side and is very small. So he's medium sensitive. Let's see if I can put him in the bucket here without dropping everything. <laughs> and we got a tiny little net spinning caddis fly. Little baby net spinner. So this was a good spot. Oh, and there's another one. Another stone fly there. Looks like you have two on your hand. That's also, I do have two on He's my hand. He's got two. I'm just crawling the stone flies here that I don't even see them. <laughs> and, ah, oh, this was the spot. Another net spinner. Net spinning caddis fly. Little baby one again. So the stone fly, of the ones we found so far, the stone fly and the, the um, both types of caddis flies, um, what else have we found? Well anyway, those ones are all in their juvenile state, so they will eventually metamorphosize into something that flies in the air. Uh, hence, they all have the name fly at the end, right? Caddis fly, stone fly. Um, so at different times of the year, they'll uh, metamorphosize into something flying. Um. So since we're talking about metamorphosizing, do you want to talk about maybe our dragonfly molts? Oh, they should go. Oh, are they in here? Oh, They're yes. in here. I forgot about that. So yeah. we before we got on, we actually uh, found some dragonfly molts. So Zach will tell you all about those. Um, if you noticed an abundance of dragonflies around you lately, it's because this is about the time where they surface from the water. So you can see this is just a molt. Uh, so this is just the exoskeleton of a dragonfly nymph. So he popped out of his exoskeleton there and was a full-grown dragonfly and flew away. So we actually have several here. We have that one. We have this one looks pretty similar. And the coolest one is this really fat guy here. Oh, and I accidentally found a stonefly. Oh. <laughs> Hold on, put him back. Uh, so this is a pretty cool example. Not only has he got a really large abdomen there, but you can see the, the little hole uh, in the exoskeleton that it made when he popped out there, right there um, below his head. So you kind of see. Um, so again, they shed these skins um, and then they go out into the world and are dragonflies. So yeah, these guys are all flying around out there somewhere probably right now. Um, awesome thing about that is when they're in their larval stage, they feed at, off of mosquito larvae, and then when they're uh, in their adult. adult stage, thank you, Zach, uh, they'll feed on mosquitoes and all kinds of greenhead flies and all the things that bite us that we don't really like. They eat them at all stages of their lives. So dragonflies also, are cool. This is a nymph, not a larval. Oh, excuse me. A nymph, not a larva. My apologies. I think they have a larval state also, but it doesn't look like this. I'll have to look that up later. We'll send you some pictures of the nymphs. <laughs> Maybe we'll find some live nymphs, but probably not because it seems like they've all... Although we might because they actually live for up to three years in their underwater state. Uh, so actually most of these guys, unlike people who live most of their lives as, a, as an adult, uh, most of these macroinvertebrates live most of their lives in their juvenile state. So it's kind of like the opposite of humans. Cool. Awesome. All right, we're just going down the river, or stream rather. Uh, start singing some songs. <laughs> see some damselflies, like adult flying ones around. So right. In the center of the screen is a damselfly. If you can see it, we'll see. Oop. She just flew away.
so if you can see um, these little aquatic plants here, um, these little sticks attached to them, uh, these are actually case building caddis flies. They're like covered in them. There's four here. You know, I'm not even gonna pick all these up. There's so many. There's a whole bunch of case building caddis flies here. So that's a fantastic sign. Oh, look, that one especially. That's covered in them. So like I said, those are very sensitive to pollution. So this water must be very clean to be able to um, have so many. Oh, we could find 100 just here. Yeah, we probably could get to 100 if we just took all of these <laughs> away, look at, look at uh, which is awesome. So that's a great sign for this stream. Look right here. This, this area in particular is covered in them. Very cool. So you'll see them um, larger than that sometimes. Uh, around this area, they're usually like that tiny little, I guess, subspecies. Um, they can be larger ones using like bigger pieces of sticks. Uh, and if you find them up in North Jersey in the Rocky Bottom streams, they'll actually use stones instead of sticks. So they just use whatever they can find. Uh, so there's actually a lady on Etsy that sells uh, jewelry made out of, she has caddis flies. Um, I got some like in a tank and she puts like tiny pieces of gold and jewels So that's all they have available to them. So they make little cases out of that and then she makes earrings out of it Cool. So, that's so cool. Yeah. So what you're saying that the case builders build their cases out of what's around them Whatever's around them, right? Whatever's available. So uh, not only is that just whatever's available to them, but then it's camouflage for uh, You don't want to look like a rock when you're you know, there's a bunch of sticks around you want to look like a stick, right? Better camouflage Awesome. I don't know what kind of aquatic plants are. Let's see if we can find anything on any of this. Gotta gotta use our iNaturalist app to uh, identify some of them. Or like, look at this. I don't know what this is. There's a lot of it. Are there any macros on it? I don't see any off the bat. Good question. We'll have to figure it out. Oh, there's the, uh, ah, there's up there. some bramble plant up here. Um, you can eat it if you want. She had tried it yesterday and it wasn't great. They weren't ripe. <laughs> Uh, this is bramble, so it's um, related to raspberries and blackberries. Um, you can eat it. They're not ripe yet. I tried one yesterday and was very disappointed. Um, but maybe I'll come back and uh, do some stream side snacking. We got a lot more caddis flies here. Same in the other area. Totally covered in case building caddis flies. Pretty cool. And we got another damselfly right up here. If you can see it. Uh, no idea. Um, probably head back. What? Probably do one, one or two more scoops and then head back. Okay. We're now going farther than we went before. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, we got a dragonfly up here. Oh, we flew away. I don't know if anyone got to see that. Is it? Oh, no, no it's a damselfly. Damsel I lied, it's a damselfly. So you can tell a damselfly from a dragonfly. The damselfly there, uh, when it's perched like that, its wings are up above, like, the middle of it, whereas the dragonfly's wings will be resting uh, to the sides of it. Good tip. Yeah, it's a lot more dainty usually too, hence the name, I think. Alright, uh, so another area to look is what are called 
called undercut banks. So the bank is the side of the stream. Uh, so the undercut bank means uh, there some erosion was caused. So it's a little um, uh, there's a little bit over top of it. So there might be some macros hanging out under here. Also very muddy, so we might not be able to find them even if they are there. Oh, I got a bunch of mud. Um, so while Zach's sorting through that, what could have caused that erosion in the undercut of the bank? Um, probably really high velocity of the stream water flowing. Um, so we just had a bunch of rain and all that water, the stream is rushing at a you know higher than average rate, um, which causes erosion. So that happens because of there being more impervious surfaces. So we're in Millville, it's kind of an urban area. Um, so instead of the water seeping into the ground through grass and wooded areas like it would do if it was a natural environment, it hits concrete and then runs into our storm water system and then goes into our streams. Um, so that's why you get a higher velocity and then that's how you get more erosion. So kind of a little fun tidbit while Zach searches through that. I saw one, but then I lost them. Sometimes a little harder to see them in the mud, but. A little scud. That's All right, little not. scud right there. There he is, moving. Well, let's put him in the bucket. All right, that was not a very good one. <laughs> All right, we'll try again. Let's go around. Maybe. Yeah, go around. Oh, where'd he go? Oh, I thought I saw a case building caterpillar. Well, I don't know where he went. Oh, see the teeny, 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 teeny little. I oh, probably can't even see with the. Oh, there's a. Oh, there's a stone fly. Where'd he go? Did I get him? No. It's one of the hardest parts. I was uh, catching yeah. these individual fast little critters. Oop. See him there? Another stone fly. <laughs> All right, so we're getting a little deep here. We'll probably turn around and sort some of the scoops that we got earlier. Um, also, I just want to say I have not found one piece of trash in this stream, uh, which is really, really awesome. So that's great. Good job, everyone who lives around here for not throwing their trash out. Good uh, job, Route 49 drivers. Yeah, go Route 49 drivers. Well, I guess it would be flying away from Route 49, so it's whatever street. Yeah, so um, the American Literal Society is trying to raise awareness about plastics this month. Um, so trying to just remind people either pick up your trash or don't use single-use disposables. And the fact that we have not found one single piece of trash here today is really awesome. So yay for not using single-use plastic. <laughs> There's a dragonfly. I think you're not going to be able to find it. <laughs> I, I saw a dragonfly, I swear. <laughs> Got another damselfly up here. Oop, two damselflies. 
This is a black bodied one. That one up there is a little blue. I don't know if you can see it. Yeah, much easier when you're walking downstream. Also quieter. All right, so if you learned what this is or you can name this, put it in the chat. There she goes. Oh, thanks. Not too far. All right, so I am going to have to walk past that area where we lost service for a second. Um, so if I lose you, I'll just come right back on. Yes, damselfly. Thank you, Regina. That was a damselfly. They're very pretty. Zach is like the crocodile hunter wading through the rivers. Oh, nice. All right, so we've got some sweet pepper bush right up here. Uh, this loves to hang out in wet areas like the sides of streams. Um, in the spring, it has a pretty white or sometimes a little pink flower. Um, and it gets its name because when it goes to seeds, it looks kind of like black pepper. So this is your sweet pepper bush. Anything new in that? What? Is there anything we didn't find in that? All right. Um, so we were out before we went live as well. And we found a couple other things to show you. So they're all sorted in this nice little container. So right here, can you get a good view of it? This is a damselfly. So this is all of the little flying guys that Lucia was pointing out earlier. It's a damselfly nymph. Uh, so you can tell what it is uh, because it's got these six relatively long legs. Um, it's got kind of a long body and especially the way you can definitely tell what it is is it's got those three tails there. Um, instead of like a lot of the other macros they aren't like really thin hairs they kind of look like fans. So uh, those are actually his gills. 
So you'll often see him stick his posterior up in the air, or up in the water rather, because he's trying to get lots of um, flow through his gills there to get plenty of oxygen. What else did we find? Uh, we've got lots of uh, case building caddisflies out of their cases right here. We saw lots of those today. So this is like, um, this is also a stone fly. I'm gonna rotate this. Okay. I'm gonna make all these guys angry and just rotate <laughs> the uh, container. Hold on, let me move them. There we go. Oh, well. So this is like a different kind of subspecies of stone fly. You can see he's a lot bigger. He's got kind of like a, um, almost like a bee coloring, right? It's like yellow and black. There he is. So he, but he also has those two posterior tail filaments, uh, just like the other, the other type of stonefly, which is actually over here. Actually, there's a few. And you can see they're much, that type is much smaller. So this guy's a lot more obvious, larger. So for our purposes, we'll just track a stonefly as a stonefly, but um, when we send out our samples to the Stroud Water Research Center, they'll actually go down and say what type of stonefly each one is. And I thought there was a sow bug, but he might have escaped. Sometimes they do escape. <laughs> we hope they make it to freedom. Uh, I think that's all our for the day. All right, so that's about it for macros. Um, one thing I do want to just compare it to, it turned off, um, is our YSI. So if you were here in the beginning, I mentioned that the macros, they can tell us the, a little bit about the water quality, um, and it's very inexpensive and easy to do. This cool machine is called a YSI. So on it, there are different probes which measure temperature, pH, turbidity, which is how clear or cloudy the water is, and salinity. Um, so let's see what measurements it took. Do you want me to hold it? Um, the, the camera, I mean? Uh, sure. Here you go, Zach. Sorry about, okay. So I have our little sheet here. Um, and Lucia is going to give us some of this basic information that we'll fill it out with. All right, so we got 87% dissolved oxygen, which right. is a nice, pretty high level, which shows because we found so many sensitive macroinvertebrates in there. 87? Yes. All right, 87%. Um, we've got a pH of 6.35, which is pretty normal for this area. 6.35. Uh, one second. Uh, Hillary asked how Stroud gets the subspecies. Do we send them pictures? Uh, they actually come with us and we'll collect the samples and they preserve everything in um, alcohol. Um, and we'll take, so they actually, we normally put our samples back and everything survives. Stroud will take them live and preserve the specimens and then they'll have um, their researchers go through and identify them each. So not through photos, but they actually do it in the lab. But don't worry, that's not today. These, not These no, ones are all going back to the stream. No macros were harmed in the making of this Facebook Live. Yeah, so that's something <laughs> that we'll do once a year uh, with Stroud, and they'll come out and collect the specimens. All right. All right. FNU. So all that really means is our water is pretty clear. So while we were walking, you probably saw there are plenty of spots where you can see the bottom, and that's a good thing. Um, it's good for visibility. It's also good so that the aquatic plants can get sunlight. Um, and I think that's everything we're doing today. Okay. Do you guys have any other questions? Nothing yet. Oh, my foot's stuck in the mud. <laughs> There we go. <laughs> um, so a little muddy on the banks. The water was high yesterday. All right. Well, if nobody has any questions, I guess we'll uh, wrap up here. Awesome. And feel free, we'll post this video. So if you get, come up with any questions later, you can just put it to that post and we'll be happy to answer them for you. Thanks, guys. Thank you.